My message, the title of today is called, It Only Takes One Man with Courageous Faith in God to Inspire a Nation to Victory. It only takes one man, everyone say one man, with courageous faith in God to inspire a nation to victory. As we pick up in 1 Samuel 17, I want us to start first and foremost with verse 50 through 53. We're going to kind of read the end of the story, and then we're going to go back and break some of it down. But most of you know the context. Goliath was standing in the middle of the valley. The armies of Israel and the armies of the Philistines were standing on opposite sides of this valley, facing off, preparing to go to war. Goliath comes down into the valley and begins to say, you know what, we don't all need to fight here. Why don't you send me your champion? I'll take on him, and whoever wins this battle, then you, the other one will serve the other. In other words, if, if Goliath beats your champion down, then you become the Philistine slaves. If you win, we'll become your slaves. There's no reason for us all to fight. And he began to spit out just angry slurs about the living God of Israel, mocking God and standing every day. He would go down and shout out, and the armies of Israel were frozen in fear. They were completely paralyzed in fear. Nobody wanted to go and face this guy. Well, why not? Because he was nine feet, five inches tall. Jeez, Shaquille O'Neal has nothing on Goliath. Nine feet, five inches tall. And here's what's scary is Goliath had brothers. <laughs> and David's mighty men actually beat them down later too. But David took the first one. Amen. And this guy was down there and just yelling at the Israelite army, and they were frozen in fear. And we pick up in verse 50, if you would. It says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted, and what did they do? They pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley into the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharon, even as far as Gath and Ekron. And then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. Isn't it amazing what the courage and the faith and the victory of one man will do to an entire nation? See, it's important to know this, men, on our end, because I think a lot of times we wait for numbers. Well, what difference can I make? What can I really do on my own? You know, I, I, I'm just one man. What can I really do? And you might be sitting there saying, well, I'm not called to inspire a nation. Whether you know it or not, you have a nation within your realm to inspire. Your family, your business, your community, your neighbors, your church, all that you are called to put your hand to is your nation that's standing up on the top of the mountain just waiting for you to rise up in courage. And what happens when you do? You inspire an entire tribe, an entire nation to run after the Philistines and say, you know what? If he can do it, we can do it. Let's go. I love it. It only takes one man with courageous faith in God to inspire a nation to victory. Now let's break this down on how he did it, okay? Can we do that? First, let's start, flip over your wood to 1 Samuel 16. Verse 13, here is the main key to all of it, right here. I'm going to give you, because most of you guys are, hopefully I'm kind of getting your attention and starting to rile you up a little bit, because you're not just one man, you are a man anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's, <laughs> nothing can take that down. 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 says this, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anoint, or 16 verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. Everyone say anointed. Anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. The first key in David triumphing over the giant Goliath is that he was anointed by the spirit of God. And we're going to see in just a moment, prior to that, all he could take down, all, but this is what he took down, was a lion and a bear. That's pretty good in my book. I'm not looking to fight any lions or bears. Um, but 
Up until that point, that's all that he could do with his own, within his own self. But when the Spirit of the Lord came on, suddenly he was anointed to take down giants. Suddenly he was anointed to lead an entire tribe of Israel. Amen. Suddenly he was anointed to stand in the gap for those who were too fearful to move forward. You see, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon your life, there is nothing that you cannot do. Men, we need to change the way that we talk about ourselves. You are not just one man. You are not incapable. Amen. But by the power of the Spirit of God that has anointed you through Jesus Christ, has given you the ability, the supernatural ability, to overcome any giant that may come your way, to lead your nation into victory, to inspire your tribe to move on towards the things of God, to bring your church up to another level. Amen. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. To preach good news, as Jesus said. To bring freedom to the captives. To proclaim liberty to those who are in bondage. Amen. To bring sight to the blind. You are anointed. Just say that with me. Say, I am anointed. See, when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon you, it was as if oil was pouring from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And men, I believe that we have got to get in line with the anointing that God has placed on us. Quit refusing to believe that you can't, or you won't, or you will not, or there's no way. Huh? Begin to step into that supernatural anointing and power. See, when David stepped into the valley to face Goliath, I can guarantee you, he was thinking of this moment. He was thinking of the fact that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There's nothing that I can't do. Why? Because greater is the Lord than anything or anyone in this world. Amen. Men, you are anointed. We need to grow into that anointing. We need to get to know that anointing. Well, how do I do that? You spend time with the power of the Spirit in worship and prayer and in His Word, and you begin to say over yourself, I'm anointed by God. I've been anointed with a fresh anointing each and every day. See, it's not just a one-time anointing. There are several anointings that will come over your life as you go from season to season. If you look at David's life, he was anointed here as a teenager. And he didn't go and take his throne. They sent him back to the sheep. Think about that for a moment. (laughs) Samuel comes in, anoints him king, and leaves. David said, well, I guess I'll just go tend sheep again, (laughs) right? But there was an anointing placed upon him to go and tend those sheep. There was an anointing on him to go and return with the sheep. It's not glamorous. It's not great. But praise the Lord, he was anointed to go and tend those sheep and minister unto the Lord. Amen. And then it said that Saul called for him and brought him out. You remember the story? And he would play the harp unto Saul. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was anointed to bring forth the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we see when he went to Hebron, later on in his life, when he was around, I think around 30 years old, he was anointed again to be king. All the men gathered around him and anointed him again. Why did he need that? Fresh anointing. New season, new things to do, new things to accomplish, new things to overcome. He needed a new and fresh anointing from the power of the Holy Spirit. And then again, when he got into Jerusalem, before he finally took the throne, they anointed him again. Why? Because he needed more anointing. He had to have greater, fresher vision, fresher anointing. So what am I saying to you guys? Every day you need to get up seeking the anointing of God because today is an extraordinary day, not an ordinary day. It's an extraordinary day with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you need a freshness, a renewal of that anointing oil flowing over you today. I guarantee, as I've said it before, just get up in the morning every day, men, and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do today? Go to your job. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in other tongues. Let the anointing of God lead you. Hallelujah. Why? Because you are anointed to lead a nation. It only takes one man with courageous faith in God to inspire a nation to victory. It only takes one man to be anointed by and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire a nation to victory. Amen. Now let's get into the story of David and Goliath. I'll set it up for you again. Well, we might as well just read the whole thing. You okay if we read the whole thing? Let's see, where do I want to start? All right, let's do 17 verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, nine feet, five inches. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. 
And now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Wow. And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. And then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And now David was the son of an Ephorite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. Now the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went over to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn next to him, Abinadab, and the third Shema. Okay? David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented himself 40 days. Now think about this. For 40 days, Goliath is doing this over and over and over again, morning and evening. No one was doing anything. Verse 17, then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these tin loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these tin cheeses to the captain of their thousands and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. And now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. Now, let me just say this, that it only takes one man to look for extraordinary opportunities and ordinary tasks to inspire a nation to victory. You see, David could have looked at this menial task and said, no way, man. I wanted to be fighting anyway. I wanted to go out there and nobody would let me. Now you want me to go and carry your cheese and your grains? To my three oldest brothers who don't really like me anyway, which we're going to find out here in a moment. No, absolutely not. He took advantage of the ordinary task. See, David never saw anything as ordinary. If you look at Jesus' life, he never looked at anything as an ordinary opportunity. Everything was an extraordinary opportunity. Why do I tell you men that? Because when you get up each and every day and you get caught in that rut of doing life and say, man, you know, gosh, I... I, I just got to go to this silly job each and every day. I come home, I'm tired, the kids are yelling at me, and I got to get ready for dinner, then I go to bed, and I get up and I do it all over again. There is nothing extraordinary happening in my life. If you begin to view every day as an opportunity to find the extraordinary in the ordinary, it'll be amazing at what God does in your life. Well, it's just going to church on Sunday, you know, nobody will really care if I'm there or not. An ordinary service can turn into an extraordinary time with God. Amen. When you go home to be with your children, if you have kids, and you'd rather just turn on the TV and ignore the kiddos. Why? Because it's ordinary. It's every day. I'm tired. Don't you guys see that I'm run down? No, I believe that through Jesus Christ, we can be strengthened and empowered to be the father that we're called to be, to turn the TV off, and to look for extraordinary opportunities with our children in ordinary tasks. But it's easy as parents, as men of God, to get tired and to grow weary and to say, you know what, I just don't want to do that right now. You could be missing out on the fact that God wants to remind you of the blessings and the beauty that he's provided for you. Missing the time of just loving on your child for a few minutes. Amen. And it goes as they grow up. It's like we were watching that video. They follow us. They look to us. Why? Because we're a representation of the Father. Amen. As we do unto them, they will relate unto their heavenly Father. We've been given stewardship, as Jerry was saying earlier. What a great opportunity for us. Amen. There is a nation waiting on you to get up each and every day with a song in your heart, which is hard for me because I'm not a morning person. Krista sings every day for us. But it's the truth with a song in your heart ready to take on the day, inspiring your family to look for joy and opportunity today. Why? Because God is the God of the universe, and he is just waiting to open doors of blessings to us. Amen. If we would just believe him and walk in them and look for them, they're easy to find. They're easy to find. Hallelujah. 
It only takes one man to look for extraordinary opportunities and ordinary tasks to inspire a nation to victory. Let's go on and keep reading. Verse 21, For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, and he will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Again, see, extraordinary opportunities and extraordinary tasks. An ordinary task. Amen. Verse 26, Then David spoke to the man who stood by, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this unsung... I love this. <laughs> David, you rock. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, who's this punk? David. Said in, you know, earlier when we were reading, it said he was short and ruddy. <laughs> Little dude, right? Who is this dude that defies the living God of the armies of Israel? And moreover, probably looking to them and saying, why are you letting him do it? It only takes one man to stand up to the giants in our culture that blaspheme the name of the living God to inspire a nation to victory. Amen. Men, it's time for us to rise up. It is time for us to say, uh-uh, that is not okay. Those idols that are being erected in our culture, those giants that are raising themselves up in immorality and unrighteousness and defying the living God of Israel, it is time for us to stand up and say, that won't happen. Who is letting this person do it? Let's go to war. Let's take this thing down. It will not invade my family. It will not take captive my children, my nation, my tribe. Absolutely not. Why? Because greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. How dare we let some of these things come up and against our culture and defy the living God of Israel. I've talked about this before. The church is just beginning to roll over. And we're taking one thing at a time. And before you know it, we're going to look back and go, how did we get so far away? Compromise after compromise after compromise. Why? Because there's nobody willing to stand up and fight the good fight of faith. There's nobody to make a commitment to say, you know what, we will not have that. This is wrong. How dare those satanic things rise up in our culture and defy the living God of Israel. Same thing with personal things in your life. When your things come against your family, is there fight in you? Is there the willingness to go into your prayer closet and to wage war against the enemy? Do you cry out unto God and say, Lord, deliver us from this. See my child, deliver him or her from that bondage, from that thing. I will not, not on my watch. Uh -uh. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies my God right in my own household? What about the things that we're letting into our household, men? Rise up, men. It only takes one man. Everyone say one man to stand up to the giants in our culture that blaspheme the name of the living God to inspire a nation, a church, a family, a city to victory. Let's go on reading. Verse 27, and the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Oh, right? Belittling. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Now listen to this in verse 30. Then he turned from him. Everyone say, he turned. He turned. 
he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Now let me tell you this. It only takes one man who is willing to turn away from the naysayers in his life to inspire a nation to victory. Turn away from those men that belittle you. Turn away from those who don't build you up. Turn away from those who don't inspire you. Can I get an amen? Don't listen to the negative talk. Don't listen to people telling you, you can't do that. There's nothing in you. You just, you got to give up. It's time to move on, right? You're not righteous enough. You're not good enough. Turn away. Put a deaf ear to those people that are naysaying against you. Put a deaf ear to the enemy when he's saying, where have you left those few sheep? Who are you to come up here and think you're going to do something? Right? Turn away from him. Turn away. To, just tell him to shut up. Sometimes you got to tell people to shut up. Marilyn's told people to shut up. Marilyn, heck, y'all heard her do it. Amen. People go and tell her she can't do something. <laughs> For those of you who know Marilyn Hickey, don't ever tell her she can't do something. She'll go do it just to prove you wrong. What about Jesus when he was setting his face to the cross? We all remember the story. Peter, the cornerstone of the church, came up and said, you'll never go to the cross. And he looked at him and said, get behind me, Satan. In other words, shut up, Peter. I was just reading in Acts 21 today when the elders were laying hands on Paul and they were prophesying over him that certain death awaited him in Jerusalem. And they were begging him, please don't go. Why are you doing this? And basically he said, shut up. Amen. Why? Because there has to come a point in our lives when we're not going to allow that uncircumcised Philistine to mock the living God of Israel. And then no matter what it takes, we set our face, we get committed, we go after it. Man, I think the greatest trick that the enemy has against you is the trick of not being committed, not seeing things through. One of the things that my stepfather always told me growing up, he said, be a man of your word. If you say you're going to do it, do it. If you say you're going to be there, be there. Right? People will start to think of you if you keep copping out and keep fading away and not holding up to your commitments. They're not going to be able to take you as a man of your word. And I think for us today, man, we have to be able to, if we say we're going to do something, if we say we're going to be there, if we say we're going to go after this, then everybody around us goes, well, it's as good as gold. Right? Jesus was a man of his word. Jesus, he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Can I get an amen? All right, stay with me now. Let's go on. Then he turned, verse 30, from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Verse 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And Saul sent for him. And then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. It only takes one man who is willing to fight for his king to inspire a nation to victory. Is that what our prayer times consist of? God, I got this. <laughs> You've anointed me to do this thing. Let not your heart fail, Lord. You won't have to look for another. Send me. Here am I. Send me, Lord. Can I get an amen? Are we ready to fight for the king? Within our church, where we are at today as a church plant, we need 50 people to rise up that are ready to fight for the king. We have got to begin to change our vision, church, because we haven't reached what I've seen in my heart. And there is growth to take place, and it's going to take around 50 of us that say, you know what? Let not your heart fail, oh God. We got this. We are committed to seeing it through. We will pray this thing through. We will be committed to the work that God is establishing through this church. Amen. And you're going to find out next weekend some more details. But I'm just laying it out there. If we're going to do this, it's time to fight for our king. Every one of us. See, David was ready to go. Why? Because he saw the fear in the hearts of the people. They were in captivity, bondage. 
David was like, no way, man. What's the deal with this? There's a community out there, church, that is in captivity and bondage. The living Philistine has come up amongst them, has begun to mock them and tell them there, there is no way. They can have no life. They're drowning themselves in alcohol and drugs, self-medicating. Divorce is taking rampant in these homes, separating families. Children are wandering the street. Well, you're just being dramatic. No, I'm not. I drive home sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, and I see 14-year-olds walking down the street. Well, what's wrong with that, Pastor Aaron? 14-year-olds should not be on the street past 10. Call me old. I loved what the, uh, when I was growing up, the Oklahoma City News used to start every night at 10. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? It's a great question to ask. But see, parents have grown tired. They can't keep up anymore. They're overcome. They're being bum- the children are being bombarded from every direction. It's a losing battle in their minds. So they just say, okay, go do whatever it is that you want to do. Church, it's time for us to rise up as life song, to rise up and say, there is an answer. His name is Jesus. He is greater than your issues. He's greater than your problems. He's come to give you life and life more abundantly. It's time for us to see salvations pouring into this church. This isn't about us. This is about them. It's about the community community out there and we have to get committed to this thing and tell the Lord let not your heart faint we've got this it only takes one man who is willing to fight for his king to inspire a nation to victory amen I know I'm getting ramped up preaching myself happy Verse 33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. And your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. It only takes one man who will constantly remind himself of the past victories God has provided him to inspire a nation to victory. Men, one key that you need to hold in your little bag of stones, as David had his little bag of stones all the time, is rehearsing the deliverance that God has provided for you before. Because it will remind you of his faithfulness and his power. See, what was David doing here? He was revving himself up, man. He was like, you know what? He's delivered me from the lion. He's delivered me from the bear. There are things in my life that you don't even know about, Saul. There are things that's happened in this wilderness that are just playing out ugly when I've been watching my sheep. And I've seen the power of my God in full action. And he can take down this Philistine just as easy as he can take down that lion and bear. And it's the truth in your life. When battles come up against you, you can remind yourself, wait a minute, uh uh-uh. I've been delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I've been delivered out of the mouth of the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine that has come against me and my family and my nation that's defying the living God of Israel will be just like those. Why? Because God, it's his battle. It's his victory, not mine. I'm just a vessel walking in the anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, God is just waiting for one man, one person to step up and say, you know what? We got this. Let's go on i got to say it again. Verse 37. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. <laughs> now, if you don't know, David was like, they say he was like six feet seven inches tall or something. He was a really tall dude. Right? He stood heads and shoulders above all the other Israelites. And here's David. Little man. And Saul's throwing his armor on him, you know, it's all clunking around. It's probably like a scene out of the Wizard of Oz or something. He's just kind of stumbling and he put on a bronze helmet on his head, you know, it probably went down over his eyes. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk. 
for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these. <laughs> I haven't even tested them. So David took them off. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag. I love that. In a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. It only takes one man who is willing to walk in the authentic gifts that God has given him only to aspire a nation to victory. You don't have to be somebody else. God has gifted you in your anointing, in your calling, in your authenticity. You don't have to be Joel Osteen. You don't have to be Kenneth Hagin. You don't have to be Mark Driscoll. You don't have to be all these other great men that stand before people on a daily basis. No, you can be, amen, Jonathan Zarbach, Jerry Chris, Tom Thompson, Leo Thompson, amen. You can be the authenticity of who God has created you to be. He has anointed you for your work, for your calling. Quit comparing yourselves to other people and begin to focus on what God has anointed you to do. Quit trying to put on other men's armor. You're just going to get discouraged. Well, I wish I had his business. I wish I had his family. I wish I had his car. I wish I had his life. I wish I had everything else everybody has. No, he has gifted you for such a time as this to be you. I'm reading through Chronicles right now, and there is one thing that Chronicles teaches you. He knows your name. If you've never read Chronicles, it is he shab begat me bab, and me bab begat t bab, and uh, just on and on and on and on. And it's like, oh my gosh, Jesus knows all of our names. <laughs> he does. You're not just a group of people. He knows Jerry begat Jessica. Jessica begat Corbin. Corbin begat nobody yet. Not for a while. Bless the Lord. But do you know what I'm saying? Men, we have to be comfortable in the anointing that's been provided for us. If you're anointed to have a furniture store, Tom, Lael, Sylvia, have the best furniture store that God has anointed you to have. If you're anointed to be an electrician, Brian, be the best electrician that God has anointed you to be. Because there's opportunity in all of our everyday menial tasks. There's an opportunity for the gospel to be shared, for miracles to take place, for hands to be laid on people, for people to come to know Jesus. Amen. Well, I only go to this really small church like called Life Song. We're not anywhere near big anybody else. Well, that's okay. We can be authentically who we are called to be. And when we find that, when we fall into that and we commit to it and we love it and we rejoice in the fact that we've been called into this body of Christ. Amen. Speaking to myself, Pastor Aaron Ingram, when we are content to walk in what he has sovereignly dished out unto us, no Philistine giant can stand in our way. Jesus was the same way. He walked in the authenticity. I loved it. <laughs> when the blind guy came up to him and Jesus grabbed some dirt and spit in it, and then rubbed it on his eyes. Think about that for a moment. I love to see the Philistine or the the uh, the Pharisee leaders just going. He, he's he's just put mud on the dude's eyeballs. What was, what's he doing? He was being authentically him. I even bet it really had nothing to do with the mud. It was just like ah, watch this, be healed, and he's gonna love you know. I can even do it with mud. Huh? You know, I don't know, but I know that Jesus. Wherever he went was authentically himself. He wasn't afraid of the religious leaders. No, nah, man, he went at them. I loved his, as we just talked about, I loved his boldness in his calling when he was sitting in the temple. See, we often, we often think with Jesus that he came down to earth with just like this extraordinary knowledge, like he was walking out of the womb, right? Like he's just like, Ooh. no, Jesus had to learn to walk. Think about that for a minute. Fully man. He just comes strutting out of the womb. I got this, man. I've been around since the foundation of the world. I, I taught you to walk. Right? No. He, think about that. The king of the universe had to come down and learn to walk. Fell down, I'm sure, several times. He had to learn to speak. He had to learn form words. 
He had to get into the temple. It says that he was in the temple daily learning the law of God. He humbled, had to humble himself to be like you and I. Why? So he could sympathize with all of our weaknesses, all of our struggles. So here's Jesus sitting in the temple learning about the law that he created. Think about that for a moment. That'll blow your minds. Like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know. Jesus is sitting there learning the law, having to memorize Scripture. I'm wondering if he's ever like, man, I'm God. Why can't I remember this? i got a test tomorrow. I am the Word. This should be natural. He had to learn it. He had to be taught it. And then I love it. He stood up in front of the entire assembly, took out Isaiah. He said, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news. Glory to God. Jesus was giving him his mission statement. This is what I'm called to do. This is my authentic, specific calling. Praise God. He has given you a calling, and it only takes one man who will be willing to walk in the authentic gifts that God has given only to him. While we're on church, did you know that when you're not here, we miss your gift? You have a gift that is for this body. And when you're not here, we don't have it. Come on now. All right, let's go on. Verse 41, so the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy, and good looking. <laughs> I love that. So the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. And the Philistines said to David, Oh, I love this. Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. It only takes one man who is willing to speak forth the victory in faith to inspire a nation to victory. Men, we got to quit being the bearer of bad news for our family's sake, for our church's sake. We got to quit being so cynical. Can I get an amen? We've got to come with hope in our hearts, speaking forth the victory of God. I love it that David was reading this guy his last will. He's just like, dude, you come. the Lord has given you. I mean, think about that. He walks up and said, I'm going to cut off your head today. Well, them are fighting words, right? Well, what was he doing? He wasn't talking smack. Maybe a little bit. David probably did talk a little smack. But he was speaking forth faith. Jesus said, speak to the mountain, tell it to be removed. Do not doubt in your heart, and you shall have whatsoever you sayeth. The city is built up by the blessings of the righteous. That word blessings in there is translated as the spoken word, the blessings that are spoken out. That is which in the city is built up, and it says it's torn down by the curses, the speaking of the wicked. What was David doing? He was speaking forth faith. He was putting into action the element of faith. Probably trying to get him. So I got down there and was like, dude, this dude is big. I better start speaking some faith. And some of you guys need to do that. You are down in the valley with your giant, and that giant's towering over you and saying, am I a dog that you come at me with this little guy? You need to begin to speak forth faith and tell that giant, I'm going to take your head off today. And you may not believe it in the back of your mind. That's all right. Just speak it. Speak it forth. Why? Because God has promised it to you. What are the promises of God for you? Let's speak those forth. Quit being a weatherman. Well, it's cloudy. It looks like rain. What do I mean by that? You're speaking forth things that you just see in the natural. Anybody can do that. 
It takes a man of God anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak forth what he doesn't see in that natural. Amen. What did Jesus say when he went up to the fig tree? He cursed it. He said, no more fruit from you. They went off to the temple, came back. You remember the story? The disciples looked at it and said, hey, look. The fig tree you cursed yesterday, it's dead. And Jesus said, yeah, I spoke to it. Whatever you speak, you shall have. There is an element that is very valuable in there. How did God create this world? How? Say it. How? It didn't just like pop out of his belly, right? He wasn't just like, boy. That's how some of us are living Christianity. We're just hoping it's going to pop out. Uh Uh-uh. He spoke. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Come on now. What has God shown you in your heart? Are you speaking that forward? Or are you speaking forth all the defeat and discouragement? No. Jeez. Some of you guys, some of we, we, it's like we live in the aftermath of the Broncos' loss. Constantly. <laughs> you know what it feels like when the Broncos lose. Like, huh. Okay, dare I remind us of the Super Bowl? <laughs> but see, here's the thing, is most of us in the spirit, we live in that place every day. I'm not talking about being sad that the Broncos lost the Super Bowl. I'm talking about in your circumstances. There's a sense of cynicism, a sense of discouragement, a sense of, oh, this is just, life can't go on. It's horrible. Uh -uh. Begin to speak forth the victory out of your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. All right, I've harped on that long enough. Let's go. Verse 47. Well, I got back at 46. I got to read again. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It only takes one man to realize that the battle is not his, but the Lord's, to inspire a nation and a tribe and a family and a church to victory. It's not your fight. It's his fight. Have you seen my daddy? So Paul said. See my dad? Yeah, he's, he's bad. That's why he wasn't afraid to go to Jerusalem. You see my dad? Come on now. There's no fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, anxiety, worry, what? But of power, of love, and of sound mind. Why? Because you have the armies of heaven backing you up. And they're taking cue from what you're speaking forth out of your mouth. Let me ask you a question. Are you confusing the armies of heaven by what you say? One day you're blessing, so they're all, okay, we're going blessing. Next day you're cursing. Oh, what do we do? And they're just confused. They're running around. They don't know what to do. Why? Because they're taking cue from your authority, from your commands, from the things that are coming out of your mouth. And the armies of heaven around you are just, like, confused. They don't know what to do. This guy is, like, bipolar. One day he's happy. One next day he's sad. What do we do? And they don't do anything. They just sit back and go, okay, well, I guess we'll just hang out until you're ready to decide which way you want to go. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. David was single-minded. <laughs> I'm going to take your head off punk. I'm going to feed all the bodies of your friends to the birds of the air. Right? Why? Because the battle is the Lord's. It's not mine. And then we return to the end of the story. Verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David and David had already said, I'm going to cut off your head. So he needed a sword. So he, therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath and killed him. 
and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to, Shur- to Shuraim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of the Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. <laughs> But he put the giant's armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David going out against Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. See, here's what we need to take home out of all of this. Is that as we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, as we rise up, the devil's going to begin to say, whose son is this? Because he looks an awful lot like Jesus. Think about him looking at his demons. Depression! Whose son is this? Right? Whose son is this? Let me tell you whose son you are. Colossians 3, or 2, 13. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Whose son are you? You are the son of the one who did this first. The armies of the devil were standing in the valley with their champion, crying out, the champion of sin, defying the living God of the armies of Israel, saying, you can't save these people. They're lawless. They're rebellious. At every turn, they betray you. At every time you do try to do something good in them, they disregard your word. They're adulterers. They're murderers. They're fornicators. They're awful people. They're standing. He was standing in the valley saying, bring anybody out. Send your champion. And if I win, they'll be my slave. Come on now. God sent this little baby into a manger. The baby grew in strength and stature in the spirit of God. He led 12 men across city after city proclaiming and doing miracles. Nailed to a cross. Pinned. Beaten. Bruised. Striped. Pierced. And the devil was standing there saying, see, I told you, bring him. Three days later, come on now. Three days later, the stone rolled away. Our champion, come on, walked out of the tomb and said, ha ha, today I will take your head off, devil, and I will give it. <laughs> I will bring it unto my king, and I will show it to him. And this day all of your demons, yeah, the birds of the air are going to eat their carcasses And as we saw Jesus come out of the grave and ascend up to heaven and take his rightful place at the right hand of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we can rise up in a voice of triumph knowing that we have been set free from the powers of the enemy, that he no longer has dominion and power and might over us anymore. We can chase him, take his goods, plunder him, lock him up, amen, and bring it unto our king and say, we got this.